Welcome to Meekum Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. It's the show geared toward keeping you up to speed with the latest auto news, event coverage, and expert industry insight. Now, here are your hosts, Matt Avery and John Craman. Hey, and welcome to another On The Move. John, man, we are really getting into the peak of the summer season and things are really revving up in the automotive world. And especially that's true with Mecham Auctions as we are so excited to be returning to Kissimmee, Florida for another summer special. And we're gonna dive more into those details in a later uh, discussion on this podcast. Before we get there, man, we have already so much uh, to talk about of what we've been up to in June. It was a very busy busy month, all kinds of events, including Mecham Auctions. But let's start with, let's go back to one of the uh, first events we attended in the month, and that was Bloomington Gold, which this year marked 50 years of uh, celebrating top Corvettes and Camaros. It was held June 2nd and the 3rd at the Illinois State University, and it featured the uh, world-famous gold collection. It featured a swap meet, live music, and of course, the Bloomington Gold judging all kinds of great activities going on. John, you and I were there for the uh, for the weekend, and I know you are a huge Corvette enthusiast and expert. What were some of your key takeaways and thoughts from, uh, from the, uh, the days there? Well, what's interesting, Matt, is, you know, we know that the introduction of the C8 mid-engine Corvette long awaited in 2020, uh, was probably going to shift the dynamic of Corvette mind speak. But what I don't think anybody predicted or thought what might happen is all it did was it put has put spotlight on the entire spectrum of Corvettes, uh, as we know from the auction. And then, of course, experiencing uh, the high quality cars that we saw there at Bloomington Gold Corvettes this year uh, is the fact that interest had never been higher. Uh, plenty of cars there that were on display, plenty of vendors there as well. The interest in the overall connection that we have with America's sports car now in 70 years of production, can you imagine? Uh, just, and that event really showcases and it's a, it's an opportunity for all of us that love that car to just immerse ourselves, not only with the cars, but the people, the vendors, a lot of restoration shops there. And it was just nonstop corvette dialogue across the board uh heavily involved with the event you know shout out to guy larson he's the guy that puts that event on it's a labor of love uh you and i throw our hats into the ring every year uh, in a variety of roles basically whatever guy needs us to do we're there to do it and i also want to give a shout out to the meekum family and the meekum executive staff that continues to let you and i really be sort of the tip of the spear to be able to attend these events not necessarily just to promote meekum auctions but because we love being in the community. We like being out there. And obviously, it pays off with visibility towards what we do as an auction company. But it goes, it, it goes way beyond that. Now that we've talked about that, Camaros have become a bigger part of Bloomington Gold over the past couple of years. And you've been a big part of that as well. What responsibilities did you have this year with Camaro? And what are your thoughts about Camaros? at Bloomington Gold. Right. Well, as you mentioned, uh, Guy has really extended the invitation to Camaros to be part of this event, John. And so now that we're in several years into that, and I will say attendance continues to grow. I was really impressed with the lineup of Camaros that were being judged this year, as well as on display. And you mentioned about just some of the ways that you and I are involved. And uh, as as usual, this year, you and I were speakers in Gold yeah. School, which is, uh, that's a great opportunity that Guy provides uh, to take advantage of some of the college lecture halls to provide very high level, very informative uh, discussions and lectures. And uh, this year, I, I was very excited. I debuted a brand new seminar um, talking about Camaro and the timeliness of it, John. We've talked about this on the show. Camaro is going away. The uh, sixth generation is going to be signed off here soon. And uh, one of the cool things about that uh, a collector's edition that's coming is how Camaro is referencing Panther Qs, which of course mm -hmm. dates back all the way to, uh, to the initial development of the model. And so I had a, a, a brand new seminar discussing, uh, discussing that, but I just bring that up only because again, it's a great opportunity for us to be out and to be amongst fellow car enthusiasts and really be talking about what we're seeing in the industry and celebrating these cars. So going back to kind of my thoughts on right. Camaros, I think um, it, looking forward to next year, I know Guy, I've already had some dialogue with Guy about even some more opportunities next year. And I'm excited to see Camaros come out and be part of this event because it really is a great opportunity to celebrate Chevrolet performance of all kinds. 
Well, and I think it gives an opportunity also an all an alternative opportunity for not only for Corvette owners that have been having Corvettes judged for years there, but also for the Camaros now being able to get their cars into the show and be judged under the Bloomington gold umbrella of judging, no pun intended to be the gold standard, ought to be a big plus. And I think that's going to help draw some nice Camaros as we move into the next couple of years. Right. All right, John. Well, uh, from Southern Illinois, we headed off to Southern California yeah. for our, our, our kind of annual California swing yeah. um, as it's developing. Uh, developing. And uh, one of the first events that we took part in was the Motor Press Guild, MPG as it's known, their drive day that, takes, that took place in uh, June 6th at the Calamingos Ranch in Malibu, California. And uh, MPG is... Uh, uh, one of the many uh, kind of regional automotive groups that connects uh, working PR folks with the OEMs, with working automotive journalists. And this year, the drive day was sponsored by Mecham Auctions and our friends with Motor Trend. And so you and I went out there to take part. And uh, there was about, I think we kind of calculated maybe around 50 yeah. of the newest vehicles out there for driving and opportunities to uh, talk with some of the, the PR and marketing folks with some of the major automakers. Uh, it was a great day uh, out there in Southern California. Any kind of key takeaways or any impressions from those days? Well, as expected, Matt, you know, California being one of the hotbeds of the EV movement, right. uh, as it's been called, uh, I would say that probably at least half and maybe even slightly more than half of the vehicles there that were on site for journalists to be able to drive, evaluate, photograph were in fact EVs. And some of those cars were cars that I had never even seen before because, um, you know, as we know, California is kind of, you know, the leading edge of the whole EV thing. So it wouldn't, didn't surprise me that uh, some of the more unique models that were there, not necessarily saying being debuted, but that I saw for the first time. But it was good seeing, I just have to say, one of the big takeaways, good seeing our folks from Stellantis were there. There were uh, some old school Dodge <laughs> performance cars there, including a Black Ghost. Right. And uh, it was just really good to see. We know that's the end of the line for that platform. Uh, the Challenger uh, and the Charger, both uh, 2023 in the current configuration. This is their final year for that. But I'm really glad to see that they were out there with some that are actually they had the uh, Chrysler 300, uh, in addition to a couple of the Challengers and the Black Ghost, of course, always the star wherever it goes. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great event. Our second year in co-sponsoring with the folks at Motor Trend. And really, you got to give credit to that event for... Meekum staffer, longtime staffer, David Morton, for being the guy that gets in there and puts all those pieces together. And it kicks off a pretty busy week for you and I out in Southern California. We didn't end our uh, California time with uh, with uh, that <laughs> event with the new cars. Right. Uh, our next stop that week, John, we headed over to uh, the Galpin Auto Sports Collection. This is uh, Bo Bachman's a uh, very well-known automotive celebrity and part right. of the Galpin Ford Empire. Uh, there, it's it's his private collection and contains some of the world's best examples, particularly of per Ford performance, it seemed like, John, from right. being able to see it. And you and I had uh, been on site last year and just were in some some uh, activities we were doing, we were able to kind of see the uh, collection from afar. <laughs> but this year we wanted to uh, actually get a, a tour. So we were able to connect with some of the uh, the Galpin Auto Sports personnel and actually able to experience the collection, go through it. And one of the major reasons why we wanted to, John, was we wanted to kind of check in with a, a familiar vehicle, the 2004 Ford Shelby Cobra concept that was nicknamed Daisy. And if that sounds familiar to listeners, that's because it sold at Mika Monterey in 2021 for $2.4 million. It's a one-of-a-kind vehicle. It's powered by a 6.4-liter V10 uh, paired to a six-speed manual. And a very fascinating aspect of the car story is that the consigner of the car at the time was Chris Theodore, right. who you and I got to spend a lot of time with. We had him on the podcast. He wrote a great book about this project. And uh, so Bo Bachman, being dialed into Ford and performance, acquired it. So it was great just to see it on display. It's a very fitting location for such a unique car. Right. And nicknamed and certainly deserving of the last Shelby Cobra. And I cannot think of a better guy or a better collection on the planet than Bo Bachman acquiring that. Uh, and of course, you know, listeners might re remember Bo as another collection that he has, the Galpin Speed Shop collection that's in a different location. Uh, was the purchaser and now the owner and on display of the 1951 Mercury known as the Hero How to Merc. So uh, heavy hitter in the collector car world. He's one of the largest automobile dealer 
in on the planet but his love of cars goes way beyond it strictly as a business aspect a great great guy didn't have a chance to see him he wasn't there that day but his handlers took very good care of us and he's probably got what at least a hundred or more cars in that uh, galpin auto sports collection right and i should mention too that uh bo was also a podcast guest so it was great just to uh right. connect with multiple individuals out there all right, John. Well, from there, we made a stop and I was very excited to take you <laughs> somewhere in Southern California that you have not been. Man, that was such a treat because you have been to all of the major automotive hotspots and to be able to right. introduce you to one of my favorites. It was pretty special. Uh, we took a little detour over to Auto Books. This is in downtown Burbank. It's a very tiny hole in the wall, but a bookstore that specializes in automotive content. And Tina Van Kern is the caretaker of it and does such a great Great job of curating it. It's a very wonderful space to be. Uh, and I will say it came onto my radar uh, in 2018. Tina invited me out for a book signing of my Copo book. Had a great time hmm. to see and experience it. And then uh, what a treat to take you there and let you see and see and experience it firsthand. Yeah, it just absolutely blew me away. That is something that I'm going to have to schedule some time to go uh, there. It's what I would call maybe the ultimate automotive library. Uh, and a couple of relatively obscure books I was actually able to pick up there uh, were uh, First Lady of Motorsports, Linda Vaughn, now 80 years old and doing surprisingly well. Anyway, she's got a really good book. It's about five years old now. Always wanted it. Picked up a couple of copies there. In fact, they had two copies and I took both of them <laughs> because I was going to see Linda at an event later uh, that week. More about that in a bit. So I was able to not only visit that bookshop that you've been talking about for a long time, but also to pick up a really couple of cool books that I, of course, had Linda sign. Um, but and there's a there's a possibility, Matt, that you may be going back there for a special event. And I just want to say it less to you, but more to the listeners that your second Camaro book, Camaro Special Editions, is out yesterday. In fact, last night, I ordered my own copy. They are now available. I think it's fairly recent. Uh, Camaro Special Editions by Matt Avery. I got it on Amazon. It's going to be in within the next week. I'll bring it in and, of course, have you sign it for me. So your book, man, it's a, it was a big, long project. It's out. It's done. It's ready for sale. Tell us a little bit about that book and where that started and, and sure. uh, where we are today with it. Yeah, quite literally hot off the press, John. I'm so excited for it to finally be released and being getting, in, getting into the hands of enthusiasts. But yeah, you've you hit the nail on the head. It was a it was a journey to get it done. All told, right around five years of writing and wow. research uh, for the project. And it examines right around 90, uh, 94, 95 special edition Camaros. Um, going all the way back to 1967 and going all the way forward to 2022. I wasn't able to get in some of the very latest uh, just because of publishing, but still it's a very wide scope examining, examining the most notable special editions. And uh, I got to say, John, one of the things I'm very excited about uh, was to introduce the idea of QR codes. And I bring it up only because one of the key aspects of the project was to have this be the ultimate resource for Camaro collectors to identify their car, to establish provenance. And a big part of that was including additional data of production specs and build registries. And a lot of that data, John, for these Camaros, because there's been hundreds, in some cases, thousands of these Camaros built, still in limited quantity but too much to put in one book. Um, and so my publisher, Cartech, and I were able to introduce the idea of using QR codes. Seems like that has become very mainstream for displaying all kinds of data. And so now as you go through the book, there's about 70 pages of bonus content that's available to the reader when you purchase the book as there are QR codes embedded in the content. And all you have to do is pull up your phone and you open up your camera app and scan the QR code and it pulls up all kinds of additional data uh, with these Camaros. So it's very exciting. I'm very excited. It's never been tried before in this format. So I really hope it really does become a true guide and resource for collectors. Well, a couple of things. I did have a chance to look at uh, one of your early print editions and it was the photographs, the bulk of which, in fact, I think all of the non uh, Chevrolet or or vintage historical photos were actually taken by you. And the way that you position the cars, the way that you got the right angles, just as a picture book, it's a world class book, but then you add, um, obviously, the great text at text that's in the book and then the QR code access to an incre incredible amount of data. I honestly think that this book could very well 
reset the bar for automotive books moving forward. Uh, and I don't mean to patronize you at all. I really feel that strongly about the book. I mean, I bought one on my own nickel. <laughs> Not that that's a big deal. But anyway, um, let's let's finish up our discussion about your book at that bookshop. Now, right. there's a little connection there between a certain well-known automotive collector, that bookshop, a previous book that you wrote, and and another maybe visit back to that bookshop uh, to, to highlight this new book. Right. So uh, Tina and I are working on scheduling another book signing for me to return to the store to sign, uh, to be available to sign copies of Camaro Special Editions. And I will say, John, uh, Auto Books is kind of a special place for me because when I was there in 2018 with the Copo signing, um, a very well-known uh, automotive celebrity stopped by, as is the norm. Hmm. Jay Leno is right around the corner with his big dog garage, and okay. he frequents the bookstore. So I will say, so he came out in 2018. was uh, an opportunity to connect with him. Uh, he took a look at the Copo book. Uh, he does have a um, Yanko Stinger in his collection, so he was particularly dialed into that. But I will say, uh, the conversation doesn't stop there, John, because when we left uh, Auto Books, we headed to Big Dog Garage. You were able to uh, to work some connections and for us to get kind of a, a behind the scenes VIP tour of Jay's collection. And I gotta say, I've seen uh, a lot of the video content that Jay has produced on his uh, YouTube channel, but I was blown away at the size of the collection just because you really don't get a sense of that when you're seeing kind of the individual spotlights on the cars, but the quantity is just overwhelming. Uh, and kind of even before we get to the cars, I think one of the striking aspects of the collection is actually the artwork. Right. Yeah, and that that was really the shocker to me, man. Now, we've all seen pictures of it and seen video in there, but this is about four large industrial buildings that were purchased that were next to each other that he's kind of opened up. I don't know what the square footage size or what the quantity of cars and motorcycles. It's just incredible. But like you, it was that artwork. And what I think makes that artwork so special is two things. Number one, it's huge. What, it, what the art looks like is vintage posters or uh, magazine ads, promotional materials. We're talking about going back maybe to maybe around 1910 up to the present day. And they look like they're just high quality blown up reproductions. But we found out <laughs> from the curator that gave us a tour, Jay wasn't there that day. What we found out was is those are actually all paintings. Right. I'll say I, I'm a little embarrassed, John, because you and I, you pointed them out. And I said, oh, John, I said, yeah, I think right. they're just, they're just blow ups. I remember high quality printing. And you were like, no, no, something's different. And you were right. We talked to the curator and it's all hand painted. And the story is, John, is that uh, a lot of it was done by artists that Jay connected with or were on the NBC right NBC team yeah yeah some of it were was actually gifted to Jay uh, NBC at different times for either birthday or Christmas present special occasions they would actually have some made for Jay and then some of them he actually had done from the NBC artist staff done on their own time but the quality was phenomenal and maybe the best part and I Jay has to just been absolutely thrilled with this was the way that some of the artwork was kind of customized with a special guest either standing next to the car or behind the wheel. I wonder who that might have been <laughs> replicated. Well, I will say, I don't think it was apparent to either you or I at first glance, but then again, upon closer examination, any opportunity there was of, of if, if people were used in the artwork, you know, for example, maybe a couple behind the wheel right. or, you know, someone walking alongside the street, some of them, the artists included Jay's likeness in it. And apparently the story goes is what we were told is that yeah. Jay does not, did not always catch it until some cases years later. Now, to be fair, there's a lot of artwork there when a new one gets hundreds, hung, hundreds. hundreds. So I will say, so if uh, for listeners, if you ever have the chance to uh, to see it or or when you're watching Jay Leno's Garage, pay attention to the walls of the space because the artwork is stunning. Now, with that being said, John, let's move to more of the hardware there on display. What were some of the favorite cars that were in Jay's collection? Well, I have to say one of the most prominent cars that at least it's popped out in my mind with Jay is a very special gold 1966 Oldsmobile Tornado. And that was the car that I wanted to see in person the most. Uh, Motor Trend Car of the Year, 1966. Uh, first time in many years that we had an American production front-wheel drive car, but of course all that's gone now. It looks pretty stock on the outside, but Jay has gone taken the whole drivetrain out, 
uh, high horsepower, big block Chevy, now driving the rear wheels, but looking to the world like kind of a, like a mild mannered 66 Tornado, legendary car, uh, one of my favorite cars of all, all the time, by the way, and that was a highlight. And another thing that was really interesting, and I talked to the curator, I looked around, I, I go, interesting, no Ferraris. And he just kind of smiled and says, no, Jay doesn't have a Ferrari. He's got a lot of European exotics. And a Ferrari is just not one of the cars that he currently has decided to have to his collection. And just kind of left it at that. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, that, uh, you know, such a prominent, significant, world-class mark would be missing from the collection. But I think that there's more to that story than uh, than, than uh, we were told. How about you? Any takeaway from, from his huge group? Well, as soon as you walk in the door, John, I, th- I think that's where I found my favorite. Jay has uh, several examples of Lamborghini's Mura. Oh, yeah. Um, are, you know, arguably one of the most beautiful cars of all time. But yeah. uh, the other key takeaway that I had is uh, just the diversity of Jay's interests. I know that uh, that is something that is out there, but to see it firsthand, Jay really does represent uh, the ultimate car enthusiast. He doesn't Absolutely. have just one niche or one specialty. Um, I don't know the earliest, but I think you identified probably early 1900s is yeah. um, it, all the way up until, you know, the certainly 2010s, maybe even newer than that. But uh, like I said, hats off to Jay for what he's doing in the automotive community, really working a spotlight. I would just say transportation in general and really getting people excited for all vintages. But it was certainly a treat and uh, hopefully something we can return to uh, maybe at a future visit. Uh, yeah. Now, another first for us, John, during this Southern California week was you and I had the chance to also head over to the Motor Trend headquarters in El Segundo, California. Uh, as we've talked about many times, including this show, that obviously Motor Trend is our uh, TV partner. We do a lot of, we're doing more and more uh, activity outside of the TV collaboration, uh, what I would call editorial collaboration in terms of producing content and sharing uh, different pieces of content. So you and I had a great opportunity to see the the uh, facility in person, including uh, their studio space. They, right. they have wonderful um, studio where production happens for some of their Motor Trend shows, as well as some photography for some of their uh, photo shoots. Yeah, and of course, Hot Rod Magazine, part of that envelope uh, as well. You know, really got to give a lot of credit for uh, also to the folks at what's referred to as Motor Trend Group, which there's so much that's under that uh, at that facility. And I didn't really I didn't know what to expect. Uh, It's kind of surprising. We've been with them now for a year and a half and we haven't had a chance to visit there yet. But I was really surprised at just how, number one, how big it was. Number two, how much staff that they have and how passionate everybody is about continuing to be involved with the tradition of obviously of print magazine, obviously of broadcasting, uh, of which, you know, Meekum now in our second year with the folks at Motor Trend. It's part of the Warner Discovery family of networks. So there's a lot of might and power behind that as well. And then to visit the, the production areas where they do a lot of television and digital content, which... I find fascinating being from the TV side, you're more on the digital side of things and you've actually begun collaborations with the folks at Motor Trend and the folks at Hot Rod and have actually provided content for them. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of synergy now beginning to operate between us and them. And I think we're all kind of cut from the same cloth. What are your thoughts about that collaboration? I think it's over the past, uh, certainly in the last year, John, we've really ramped up. And I think it's it's just a great opportunity uh, for both organizations to benefit, but also the um, enthusiast also benefits just because it provides right. so much more content. So some of the opportunities you've talked about is uh, more and more we're having um, hot rod personnel, including KJ Jones, um, a friend of ours, uh, who's right. coming out to more and more Mecham auctions. He's producing um, hot rod stories on site at the auction. Um, we've had him and others on the TV program as well. Right. Uh, but then what you're identifying from more of the digital side um, on hotrod.com is that hot rod in return is also utilizing some of the content that uh, uh, me and the on the move team are producing. Some of the highlights from uh, the last year include we had a 
big uh, collection called the Firehouse Find um, that was a great group of cars uh, that were tucked away in a Georgian firehouse. And uh, so uh, uh, me and Phil Brom, our social media manager, went down, produced all kinds of video content, and that was included in several of the hot rod stories. So it's just, it's a great opportunity just to kind of share content and just to get more and more exposure for these cool cars that we're both coming across. Yeah. Well, bottom line on that one, Matt, it was a great, it was a great opportunity for us to, I think, take our relationship to the next level. And uh, man, really looking forward to obviously to working uh, with those guys as we move into the future. Now, our week in California is not over with yet. At least it wasn't for me. You were on your way uh, headed off to the the next thing we're going to be talking about. But before I left California, I was at the Peterson Museum. And of course, we've talked about and pretty much I think the automotive world knows that uh, we lost Jim Wangers, age 96, known as the godfather of the GTO. Well, the Peterson Museum, they did a celebration of life for Jim. And uh, Gordon Wangers, his nephew and his caretaker, uh, invited me and a handful of others to actually speak on behalf of Jim. Those of us that knew him, I've known him for over 40 years. And uh, man, what a group it was. Linda Vaughn had been asked to speak. She was there. Of course, I was there. Dave Anderson, the guy that traveled with uh, uh, Jim Wangers for about 20 years, was actually an employee, was there. And then the owner, uh, Tenny Fairchild, uh, the owner of the most famous GTO in the world, the original cover car from the 1964 Car and Driver, March 64 issue, uh, the cheater car that had a 421 in it. That car still exists today. Uh, He spoke on behalf as well. What an honor and thrill it was for one of my lifelong heroes, Jim Wangers, to be there. Huge crowd, lots of cars. Dana Meekum sent the gold, his gold, 1965 GTO known as the Hearst GTO Tiger. That was the giveaway car for a contest that Jim had put together in 1965 with a special song. You count the amount of times it says GTO Tiger. You send that in, and then they picked a winner. A guy in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, won the car back in 1965. Uh, it's in surprisingly good original condition. It has been repainted, but the rest of the car is pretty much original. It was there uh, with some other very prominent historic GTOs. Overall, a fantastic event. And yes, Linda Vaughn, Miss Hurst Golden Shifter, she signed my books there at that event. Age 80, she's doing just fine. So you were headed out to an event that's your second year of participation, kind of tying in once again with the relationship that we have with the folks at Motor Trend and the folks at Hot Rod, Hot Rod Power Tour this year. You were there, I wasn't. How was it? Yes, sir. The 29th annual Hot Rod Power Tour, John, kicked off June 12th, that Monday. And uh, it was great to be back, as you mentioned, returning for my second time, taking in this uh, ultimate summer road trip. Uh, This year, it uh, started off at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, made its way through South Carolina at the state fairgrounds. Next was Rockingham Speedway, then to Z-Max Dragway before ending up in Tennessee at the Bristol Motor Speedway. And uh, John, I was pretty excited to be behind the wheel of one of the latest uh, Mecham and Dodge marketing vehicles, a 2023 Durango SRT 392. Yeah. Uh, obviously very well equipped for a multi-day journey in the uh, southern, southeastern heat of summer. But man, it was so great, John, um, as you and I discovered last year, just to take in all things Hot Rod Power Tour and s- to still identify and appreciate the long hauling um, experience. Um, and we've talked about this uh, during our recap of last year's event, but um, uh, Hot Rod has a long standing tradition of for people, for attendees that participate the entire week, drive to every stop, get their badge punched, and they can prove it. They kind of uh, classify them as long haulers and they have a special award. And I will say, John, what's so fascinating is how many people strive for that and they take off from work to be part of this long, week-long uh, opportunity. And it's, it's just so fascinating to see the diversity of cars that they're doing it in. It's almost a challenge of getting uh, vehicles that aren't even fully restored, but you know that they're working hard to get them down the road. Uh, and it's just so great to see that passion and enthusiasm for motoring, uh, and cl- certainly classic motoring, but great to be back. Um, and then the other big news, John, this year, okay. well, a little bit of a hot rod news. Uh, hot Rod has is celebrating a major milestone this 
this year, marking 75 years of the Legendary Magazine. For this year's Power Tour, they pulled the cover off of a very well-known uh, project car that they've had, the 1957 Chevy, known as Project X, that the, the, the magazine in one form or another has been modifying for decades. The last time that I saw this car was at SEMA of 2021, okay. and the big news was it had an E-crate conversion, uh, just kind of showcasing theoretically what hot routers could do with that kind of technology. Sure. And it kind of ruffled some feathers of the hot rod faithful. Well, this year, John, they are going back to their roots and they have yanked out the E-crate uh, system and they have put in one of GM's uh, ZZ632 crate engine rated at over a thousand horsepower. It was very well received. Great to see hot rod kind of returning to those ice roots. Yeah, really glad to get that report about the Project X, Matt. You know, I remember that car as a magazine feature car in the now gone, of course, popular hot rodding back in the early to the mid 1970s, where it seemed like almost every issue they were trying different components, rear ends, transmissions and engines. But, you know, that car really became really became a a cult hero. It was featured in a movie called The Hollywood Nights. That was with Tony Danson, Michelle Pfeiffer, a great, great period movie uh, highlighting uh, a drive in the, that was closing uh, in 1965. And it was the last night that it was open Tubby's drive in. And if you haven't seen the movie, The Hollywood Nights, check it out. You will see this car in there. And I just want to say it's referred to Tony Nancy, the famed automotive customizer from the 60s, is actually in the movie. And they refer to the yellow that Project X has been known for. And he refers to it as Tony Nancy yellow. That's just part of the part of the script of the movie, but really glad to hear that Project X is doing well with a high horsepower ice engine. Hey, just want to do the June travels not over with yet, man. I'm just in a day or so. I'm heading down to the GTO Nationals 44th annual, by the way, Springfield, Illinois this year, Meekum proud sponsor. And on Saturday, July 1st, I'll be, first, I'll be doing one of my uh, one of my forums, uh, I call it inside auctions in the collector car market geared towards GTOs. And that will be on Saturday, July 1st from 1030 until noon. If you're going to be down there, be sure to say hello. And, uh, you know, always look forward to, uh, you know, heading down and hanging out with the GTO folks. I've owned my 64 GTO since July of 1976. I bought it when I was 19 years old and I still own that car today. <laughs> Very cool. All right, John. Well, uh, before we certainly move on from June of all the events going on, there was also another major Mecham event. Mecham held the world's largest yeah. road art auction. This took place uh, June 20th through the 25th at Mecham HQ in beautiful Walworth, Wisconsin. Right around 4,000 lots, John. And and this really was an, um, an industry first, uh, and what a great event. Uh, what were some of the high sellers? Because you and I were talking about the diversity of consignments and just some of the rarity of the items. Yeah, it was unbelievable, Matt. About $12 million of sales are still in the process. It just got over with a few days ago. So they're just in the process of getting all the numbers put together. There will be a final listing of everything. Uh, of all the totals and all the specifics, but it looks like we're, it looks like about $12 million was generated. Some of the absolute shockers, Matt, uh, include a Kelly tires, two-sided porcelain sign from the 1920s, not neon. It sold for you ready for this $265,500, a star lanes bowling alley neon that was out of Santa Monica, California which was the site of where the movie, The Big Lebowski, was filmed. Now, this sign was not in the movie, but uh, that sold for $247,900. A Caterpillar John Deere two-sided neon sign, $177,000 unbelievable results. What are your thoughts about all that craziness? <laughs> well, it shows, John, that the world of automotive collecting is well beyond just anything with four wheels. Collectors far and wide love accumulating all of the additional, again, what Meekum calls road art so appropriately, all of the other items of interest that have uh, gone alongside with these cars and trucks that we've loved for the last several decades. And of course, a high watermark, I think, is the kind of that retro period of neon. And I will say one of my favorite parts of being on site at any Mecham auction is seeing the road art examples on display lit up. It really has just a whimsical sense of magic. Yep. And this, the, this road art auction being the world's largest, I know it really was a treat for a lot of enthusiasts and clutchers to be there on site and see it in person 
see all these signs lit up and see all these, again, just pieces from the road, you know, gas cans and, and um, uh, gas pumps and just all the other signage that goes with it. So really special. And uh, I know it was a big treat for, for people that were there. Yep. And be curious to see what happens next year. We're going to stand by for that. As soon as we hear any details, we will be the first to report. Absolutely. All right, John. Well, speaking of details, hey, let's transition to some car news. You and okay. I always are looking to see what is happening out there in showrooms and in the new car industry. And one of the segments that you and I are really kind of revved up about the, I'd say, affordable two-seater sports car market. Right. Uh, it's it's kind of had a revival in the last year or two with uh, current entries as well as some new entries. And so we've got some little, some buzz happening, starting with uh, the 2024 Nissan Z. Nissan has shown off that they are going to be offering a Nismo performance oriented right. variant coming. Very exciting because you and I both have had the chance to drive the, the non-Nismo uh, version. And right. frankly, I think we both love the car. Yep. Great balance, great performance, uh, great usability. And so now we're going to get a performance variant. Right. And not surprised to hear that, Matt. Uh, it's just been teased so far. Nissan has put out a really cool video with a drifter putting it uh, through its paces. Uh, it does show the cosmetics of the car, very distinctive, kind of a blue-gray color with some really cool red trim. Uh, but we don't know anything. We don't know if the 400 horsepower twin turbo 3 liter V6 is going to be pumped up. I'm going to predict that it will. I think we're going to see a little bit of extra power, which would be kind of part of the Nissan Nismo strategy that we've seen in the past. We might see another 25 or 50 horsepower, but we but we do know the car is going to be a little bit sharper handling. It's going to brake a little better, and it's got a very distinctive look. Right now, they're just teasing it, but I think over the next month or two, we're going to be learning more about that, and it's not just all about Nissan. Uh, our other uh, Asian major manufacturer, Toyota, has kind of kind of you know fought back uh with their supra there it's a direct competitor with the z car and also the gr86 their little sort of their little compact little cool two-seater with some very special additions there as well so i think the future looks really good for and of course all these cars matt available with manual transmission. What do you think about Toyota jumping into the hoops with some special editions? Right. Well, I think it's it's a good time, John, because the Super has been on the market for a couple years now. And, and you and I you and I have had a chance to drive one and we liked it. It oh, yeah. has not gone over as well with enthusiasts as I think Toyota expected it to. So I think you're right that uh, as part of an ongoing effort to kind of keep interest high, uh, Toyota is offering a 45th anniversary. Now, it is a cosmetics only package It's going to be offered in two colors, Micon, Micon Blast and Absolute Zero gets graphics and black br uh, brake calipers and really the only kind of performance, quasi-performance uh, piece is a real rear spoiler. But be that as it may, John, I still think it shows that Toyota is trying to tap into some heritage and let their uh, following know that, hey, they haven't forgotten about this model. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, in regards to the Nismo, Toyota offers some kind of a performance-oriented Supra in the works. And I think this is all great news, John, for performance-minded enthusiasts that love driving. These cars really have that in their crosshairs. They are light, they are nimble, they are fun. Uh, and so I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, Matt. Uh uh, you, you mentioned no hardware updates on the Supra, but I just want to say that that standard turbocharged three liter inline six uh, sourced by BMW, of course, legendary engine, it's 382 horsepower, but you and I had a chance to spend some time driving that car and it has a punch that operates outside of what sound what might sound like a modest uh, horsepower rating of 382. It feels much stronger than that. And one of the two colors, it's a you mentioned the two colors, the fancy name, but there's an orange and a white. The orange is absolutely draw chopping. You have to see, if you haven't seen this online, go take a look because this car really, what they've done with the black striping and that orange paint, bring that car to a completely different aesthetic package. Going to be, going to be fun to see how those do once we probably are going to see one on a Mecham auction block. Well, speaking of that, John, we are gearing up for Mecham's return to Kissimmee for another summer special. Uh, this is going to be taking place once again at the Osceola Heritage Park, July 6th through the 9th. 
target of 1,500 vehicles, six collections. And John, I think uh, it's a great opportunity to let listeners know a little bit about the genesis of this event, uh, because now uh, as part of Mecham's calendar year, there are two big auctions that take place in the Florida market. Of course, a lot of people are going to be aware of the Kissimmee auction that uh, Mecham has held for many, many years. And now we have this summer special. Let's kind of go back to where this event originated from. Right. The uh, Mecham auction in January uh, at Kissimmee, Florida is in fact the world's largest collector car auction bar none. Now, why do we go back basically six months later in the middle of summer? Well, we go back to the pandemic era. We know that uh, there were certain locations and venues that we were not able to hold uh, auctions at for a variety of reasons, but the folks in Florida were open to have us under some controls and rules to have us back down there kind of as a placeholder just to go ahead and add an auction to keep our business model moving forward. But what we didn't know, Matt, was is we didn't know at the time uh, three years ago that it was going to turn into an event that we're probably going to put permanently on our schedule. So here we are now back for the third year in the Orlando area. Now, last year we were at the Orlando Convention Center. This year, as we were in the first year of our summer special, we are back to our familiar territory, Osceola Heritage Park, for four big days, July 6th through the 9th. And what makes that especially fascinating, Matt, is as of a month ago, it was only a three-day auction with a thousand car target. Well, we added an extra day due to demand. We added an extra day. And we took our target from 1,000 cars to 1,500. And I think we're probably going to have close to that 1,500 uh, car target uh, that currently is out there. We've got 12 hours of live television coverage coming up on both Motor Trend TV and on Motor Trend Plus. And one of the themes, you mentioned it, six collections, one of the themes, once again, part a big part of what we do. And one of the big collections that's really impressive that uh, really popped out at me is called the Mitchell Estate Collection. 37 vehicles, all selling at no reserve. A lot of great pre-war Ford V8 classics. Uh, Thunderbirds from the 1950s. There's a handful of Corvettes. Literally everything, Matt, from A to Z, including a motorhome and a late model Tesla Model 3. Everything is going to be selling at no reserve. Uh, What are your thoughts as we start getting cranked up for our Kissimmee summer special. <laughs> well, John, it's a great uh, it's a great midsummer event to attend uh, right smack dab, almost in the middle of June, July, and August. And like you said, the diversity of what we're seeing being consigned is wild and interesting. There are classics, there are muscle, there are late model exotics. And I got to say, I think that's kind of reflective in my trio of picks. Okay. Uh, as part of our uh, discussion, you and I set out to find three consignments that were really catching our eye. Yep. And I think I've got quite a diverse pick, starting with one of the vehicles I'm going to be paying close attention to is lot number S, 158.1. It is a 1968 Corvette that is a multiple award winner, mm. Bloomington Gold certified, NCRS top flight. It's a great color combination. Le Mans blue with a blue interior with a white top, recent frame off restoration, and under Underneath the hood is the 435 horse tri-power V8. But John, just a little bit of extra magic is this one was sold new at the legendary Nikki Chevrolet in Chicago. Great, a great collector. And then um, a second consignment really kind of swinging um, the pendulum in a different direction. Lot number F99. This is a 1983 Lincoln Continental Mark VI. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that we have a great group of collections and this car comes out of one of those. It is uh, part of the low mileage collection, which if you haven't seen it, you really got to see the vehicles included because it's one of the largest groups of 70s and 80s American luxury cruisers, land yachts that I land yachts that I have seen. And this one is a great example. Original paint. It's got the rare factory carriage roof in just under 4,000 miles. And then from there, John, uh, one of my favorite early 2000s pocket rockets. It's lot number S87.1, hmm. a 2005 Dodge Neon. On SRT4. Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of the modern conversation about performance coming from Dodge, John, is from the SRT uh, team, Street and Racing Technology, which, again, today everyone I feel like knows SRT from doing the Hellcats and the Demons, but really they got their start in the early 2000s during this era. And this is a great example. This is powered by a 2.4 liter turbo four cylinder, and it's painted in a striking orange blast pearl paint. I love it. Under 14,000 miles. 
And uh, again, just a, a really eclectic group. Now I'm curious, I, I have no idea, what, what were the three vehicles that were catching your eye? Well, you know, a lot of times we like to pick vehicles that are of extremely high values. I think in this particular case, and one of the themes of this auction, Matt, is going to be that the lineup is going to be chock full of entry and mid-level collectibles, which really represent the heart and soul of what car collecting is all about. So I'm going to go with an all GM trio and just kind of kind of pick that as a theme. Uh, the first one, lot number S93.1, is a 1963 Pontiac Grand Prix with the optional 421 cubic inch power plant. Uh, of course, it's an automatic transmission. It's got three two-barrel carburetors as well. And I love the color combination, Matt. It's silver with the red interior, and it's got those optional eight lug wheels. Staying in the GM mix, uh, lot number S95 is a 1965 Buick Riviera. Now, that's the final year for the first generation of Buick Riviera and considered by most people to be the most collectible of all Buick Rivieras at 1965. It's just got that classic look. 425 cubic inches of Buick nail head power with the turbo hydromatic automatic transmission. And it is black inside and out with those chrome Buick road wheels. But maybe my favorite of this trio, Matt, is a 1979 Pontiac Trans Am with the optional 400 cubic inch, 220 horsepower uh, Pontiac V8 in the final year for the big 400 cubic inch engine and only available with a four speed. This is a well-documented car. It's the Bandit Edition, which is known as the Y84. Uh, About 1,100 of these cars were built with that four speed uh, and that 400 Pontiac engine mostly original it's had some paint touch up done but primarily original under twelve thousand original miles got the original window sticker tons of options including t-tops and power windows and all that kind of stuff but no radio it was not huh. ordered with a radio it's not on the window sticker and it's not in the dashboard there's a block off plate right where the radio would be don't know the story on that don't know if there's somebody that was uh uh, was going to put in an aftermarket stereo or for whatever reason didn't want a radio i have seen and been familiar with cars in the past where uh the person that ordered it was deaf and just decided i'm not going to spend the money to you know put a radio in a car that i'm not going to be able to listen to uh but perhaps one of the most unusual 79 trans ams significant because it's a banded edition it's the four speed it's primarily original it's low mileage and it's highly optioned minus the radio <laughs> well great picks there john and of course if uh, listeners want to find out more get all the details on these consignments and all the rest as well as the other details related to the Kissimmee summer special at mecom.com and john as we close out today's show it's so important to note that this is far from all of the mecom auctions that are coming up as right after mecom Kissimmee. mecom is off to harrisburg with an auction being held once again at the pennsylvania farm show complex at the end of july much more to come on that. So lest you think summer is cooling off, things are just heating up. You've been listening to Meekin Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekin.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.